Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Geeking Out Podcast. I am the Athletic Geek, and my guest this week is somebody who I've recently seen at Stride Pro Wrestling and got the chance to talk talk to a little bit at the uh, Rent One Park Stride Pro Wrestling show. It is Jake Bravado. Jake, how are you, man? Doing all right. How are you doing, brother? Not too bad. Uh, appreciate you doing the show. Appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you having me. It's always a blast to, to reach out and, you know, kind of interweave through the internet, through different facets. And so I definitely appreciate you having me. Oh, awesome. Glad, I'm glad that I'm having you part of this, uh, this project. Um, so my first question to all of my, my wrestling guests are, were you a fan of pro wrestling growing up? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Deb, I couldn't quite tell you once I officially got into it, but it was a very young age whenever uh, I first started to. So I, I can definitely say that for sure. Do you remember who some of your favorite wrestlers or uh, so, storylines uh, or anything were growing up? Early on, early on when I was still living, uh, I was living in Fort Campbell, Kentucky at the time. My mother was in the Army and I was living on base with her. Oh, awesome. And I remember watching a lot of early SmackDown. Um, so, I mean, you know, I really didn't register with a lot of the names. You know, it was just more so the guys that kind of stood out and with their own unique look. You know, uh, a lot of my my favorites early on were guys like Rey Mysterio, guys like Kane, you know, later on, Ultimo Dragon. There was a lot of WCW guys that I was really into, and a lot of them happened to be, you know, luchadors and uh, some of these other looks, so to speak. Awesome. Um, kind of sidebarring real quick, uh, you know, you mentioned that you're uh, growing up in a military family, you know, your mother being in the military. What was it? Was there a lot of traveling uh, whenever you were a military, or did you kind of settle into to one base, or what, what's it like growing up a, a military child? Not necessarily a lot of traveling. Um, I had family that their home was in here, Southern Indiana. And, uh, so, you know, I wasn't always too far from them between living in that area and living in Fort Campbell, really not too far from there. Currently in the Evansville area, you know, it's always been pretty central gotcha. from there. Gotcha. Um, where is Fort Campbell at? I'm the, the, I know some of the military people who listen, to this will be, uh, you know, uh, their jaws going to drop, but I don't know where that's at. Where's that located? It's uh, it's it's almost the the border of Tennessee. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how close Christian County is to the border, but uh, I can tell you. I mean, it's not even a far drive, and um, I actually pass through it more often than not, just because of you know reminiscent on uh, old older times and growing up on base was was kind of unique. You know, there was a lot of stuff I didn't comprehend at that age, but you know, uh, playing football outside and uh, You'd see a Chinook coming in to land or, you know, that was always kind of a cool thing. There was a lot of uh, interesting history, you know, around there. So that was always something that really stood out to me, kind of fascinated me. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, what's it like growing up on a military base? I mean, I, do, I have some people who I do know that are in the military. They talk about, eh, it's just like being in a community, man. And then some other people talk, like you said, there's just a different vibe to, you know, just living in a regular neighborhood what was what what was it like for you to grow up on a base uh you know some of those things like i mentioned there were there wasn't a whole lot that felt different uh i was pretty young so not a whole lot of recollection on that gotcha. uh, you know obviously we had to pass through checkpoints to get into to going home that sort of thing uh, i didn't have to to go around and, and be with my mother whenever she was you know taking a call or going to check in with something i didn't have to travel around with her a lot for that either right so it was uh it was a little different it was interesting yeah definitely a sense of community there um what was your mother's job in the military if you don't mind me asking um one second here i think i uh oh you sound you sound great <laughs> I think I'm messing up here on my. Let's say on my end, you're good. If somebody tried to call me and. Uh, gotcha. Okay. Sorry about that. You're and it good. rerouted everything. Gotcha. I understand. But yeah, on my end, you sound great. Um, 
everything coming in clear. Okay, cool, cool. Um, but what was your mom's job in the military? Um, I couldn't tell you what her MO was exactly. It was something to do with air traffic control in some capacity. So I got to see, uh, you know, some of the hangers. I got to, I mean, as a kid, I probably couldn't do it now, but as a kid, I could identify each of your different choppers and, and I knew a little bit about them. It was kind of cool. Awesome. Um, so growing up military family, you mentioned playing football and everything. Um, what, what, what all sports did you play? And do you feel that those sports eventually helped you when you made the decision to become a professional wrestler? Uh, indeed. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. I would say that played a big part of it for, for my transition personally. Um, you know, I was into football. I was into, I uh, ran track. I, uh, did amateur wrestling as well. Um, I was always kind of in season. I always had something to keep me occupied. There was soccer in there for a little bit. I tried baseball. I always tended to uh, gravitate towards the more physical sports, you know, football, wrestling specifically. Um, and I, I do think they really, really gave me a uh, so much more to work with when it comes to physical tools and, uh, you know, body control, that sort of thing. Um, and it really surprised me, you know, and then at the number of guys who, you know, when I asked them, had no sort of athletic background whatsoever. And it really kind of uh, was kind of shocking at first because I couldn't imagine. Right. Um, so you mentioned doing wrestling in high school. Were you open with your wrestling teammates that you were a pro wrestling fan or is that something that, you know, there's. Always, in some cases, not always, but in some cases, there's kind of that, you know, uh, stigma around pro wrestling, especially when you talk to other uh, freestyle wrestlers, you know, about the nature of the wrestling business. And that's that's kind of why some of them don't particularly care for pro wrestling. Did you have to hide the fact that you're a wrestling fan or could you be uh, open about no, it or did no. they give you any shit or, you know, just what was it? There, there was always going to be those few that, that wanted to kind of, you know, make that big divide between the two. And uh, no, no, it didn't ever bother me. Nobody really came after me too hard for it because, I mean, there was plenty of guys that were pro wrestling fans, you know, and I mean, a lot of them respected uh, the difference, you know. Of course, you had, you, you know, your fake shit guys and all that. And I, I even talked to some people in school that, wanted to try to tell me UFC was fake and that sort of thing. So, I mean, I didn't really take any of that into consideration, you know, those opinions, so to speak. Gotcha. Okay. That's good. At least. Um, so what, when do you decide that you want to try to make a career at professional wrestling? Is it immediately after high school? You know, do you go to college and then decide, do you, do you follow in your mother's footsteps for the military? What, what led you to eventually make the decision to be a pro wrestler? So initially, you know, uh, there was there was some football in there for a little while, no collegiate level football. There was some semi-professional football that was good fun for a while. Oh, and, well, hey, um, well uh, tell me about being a semi-pro football player because, you know, that, that seems like a dream job to a, a lot of us uh, former high school athletes and uh, former college athletes. What What is it like to get to continue uh, – to play a game like football after after high school and in on a semi pro level. I mean, I'll be honest, if I could still manage to do it right now, I definitely would. Uh, you know, football has always been my one my one sport and uh, it was a lot of fun, you know, even playing, you know, after school because at that point, you know, you begin to mature with your body and your mind and stuff starts to to register a lot better and I feel like, you know, um I wasn't able really to find my stride until after, you know, I got done playing at a, a school level and, and semi-pro. It was fun, but it was just that, you know, it was semi-professional. So you didn't have the same amount of preparation. Obviously, you didn't get to uh, to have the full dedicated practices that you would have had, you know, in school. Uh, what, so, what is I a mean, semi-pro, if, if you don't mind, because – I'm really interested in hearing this. What's like a semi-pro 
practice, season, travel, schedule? What what is all that like? Because you mean there's there's different. I know there's different leagues, and some you know people make actually can make a, a living wage doing it, and some people it's it, it, much like you know pro wrestling. It's some people can do it on that level and make a living wage and they're happy. And some people, you know, they got to go as soon as practice is over, they got to get up and go to work. So what, what was it like right. for you? Now, um, it wasn't, you know, like, a some of those startup leagues wasn't anything to that magnitude. Um, let me see. I mean, it was really interesting to see the, you know, talent differences between different teams and you know usually the leagues weren't too far as far as travel distances or anything i think the furthest i ever had to go for a game was about four hours to dayton and uh you know of course seasons would typically run early spring until about the end of the summer just depending on how things were you know there were instances where teams couldn't field enough guys and they'd have to forfeit there were instances where you'd go somewhere and you know, obviously traveling would be difficult for everybody in their own manner. Right. And so you'd be using less guys against, uh, you know, like that Dayton game, for instance, I think we went up with about 20, 25, maybe 30. Gotcha. All together. And so a lot of guys had to play all 60 minutes and, you know, we're going against people that are, I don't know, we're talking 40 to 50 players on a team. So it, it could differ for, for better or worse. I mean, uh, there were there were some games where you kind of just walked in and walked all over people, and there were other games where you really had to screw in and and come to play, and there was no way to to properly prepare for it due to the limited practices, due to no uh, no information, no scouting, nothing like that, you know. So I mean, it could really range. What was the practice like in your in your case? What was the practice schedule like? Did you to practice every day, to practice every other day. What was it like? There'd be two, two to three nights a week on average, I'd say. You know, and of course that wouldn't come until like six to eight for those guys to be able to get off work, get away from their families. Some guys couldn't always make it. So sometimes the the practices would be um a little different than normal. You know, guys would have to to do a little more just to give other ones a look, you know. Um sometimes you could get practice at a certain position all you needed to other times you would have to stand in for something else just to like I said complete that look and, and give everybody a chance to, to really kind of retool and so that I don't want to say it ultimately got me to the point to where I was done playing semi-professionally but it really kind of took the edge off of things with as much passion as I had with as much preparation as I put into it it wasn't always the same, you know, and, and it couldn't be. It couldn't be reciprocated to everybody else. Not everybody had the time to, to be able to go and do all that, and that's understandable. But um, ultimately, it led to me kind of taking some time away from that, and that's where I found my footing with starting off professional wrestling. Awesome. So, you know, done with, done with semi-pro football, you – decide to pursue professional wrestling. Uh, what school did you go to? Who trained you? How did you find out about that school? Take me, what was the, what was the thought process like as you were going from being a football player to pro wrestler? Um, so originally, you know, being a fan, I was a fan for so long as a kid, kind of grew into to getting a little bit older. Stopped watching it as much, got into a few other things, and uh, didn't really pay as much attention to it. And so, you know, four to five years later, we're talking, uh, graduated, been playing football for a while, started getting back into watching wrestling a little bit more, just because uh, I remembered how, you know, exciting it was growing up. So, do you remember I mean, any that, of, that always... When you got back into watching wrestling, do you remember any of the wrestlers where you're like, wow, you know, like that kind of hooked you back again and made you go like, oh, yeah. This is why this there is was good. a lot of the same guys, a lot of the same ones that I grew up watching. I want to say I stopped watching probably about 2007, 2008. The last WrestleMania I saw was uh, 23, 
And then gotcha. I think the next one I ended up watching was like 31. So there was a, a pretty big gap there where I didn't really follow it as heavily. Wasn't up to date with uh, anybody. But whenever I started getting back into it, um, you know, this was around the time of guys like Kevin Owens, uh, Finn Balor had, had just, you know, had to drop the Universal title, uh, that sort of thing. I, I knew who, you know, your guys like Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns were. I just wasn't ultimately familiar with um, what they had been doing in that time. And uh, I, I will say, you know, watching, watching a guy like Kevin Owens, uh, he's so good. He's so good, man. And, and seeing him being able to, to do such a high level of performance, you know, he might not be the, the most, the biggest guy on the roster like you're used to seeing, you know, he's not necessarily one of these guys that's going to fly all over the ring and, and do all this uber crazy athletic stuff. But he was just a, a a great worker. You know, you could see the tenacity. You could you could really feel the emotion, in in the way he told stories. And so it, it really kind of appealed to me. I was like, man, you know, this this guy is doing it at the highest level right now. You know, and it made me kind of curious to to what extent could I get myself to? You know, right? Because I feel like there were a lot of things that I could resonate in, in seeing him perform with myself you know um and ultimately i ended up getting talking to a guy uh that i had known since i was a kid and he had done some professional wrestling work and kind of just loosely spitballing at the idea one time with him you know he was working security at a bar that i was at and i was just kind of talking to him you know amidst having some drinks and all that and right. uh and he was kind of telling me, you know, if you're serious, I, I can get you going. You know, we we'll just have to do a couple of things like, you know, get licensed in the state of Kentucky where I started training initially. And who was and, the guy? Not to cut you off. I apologize that? for that. But who was the guy you were talking no, to? His name uh, is Micus. And I, I want to say he's worked most recently under Mike Micus. Okay. I know he's done some work in St. Louis in the past. And like I said, he was. Uh, he was actually somebody I knew from, from when I was in like fourth or fifth grade or something like that. And, you know, he made that offer and I was like, well, let me, let me check it out. You know, let me, let me get the ball rolling and, and see what it's really like. Because I've, of course, you know, growing up a fan, I always wanted to get in between the ropes and, and see what, what it's like. Right. So I took him up on that and uh, I ended up training with him very early on. You know, uh, there were some other guys up and coming around that area. Uh, like the the Murphy boys and and the, those were some of my first training partners and uh, it was um, wasn't like you know going to the Nightmare Factory it right. wasn't anything substantial but I started picking up some pointers being coached up by some guys who had good talent and uh, was able to kind of piece some stuff together. And where was this school based out of? Uh, really, it, it was it wasn't even a school. It was just a, a guy that owned a promotion had his ring set up in, in Owensboro and uh, you know he would go my buddy Mike just would go and get his ring time and do his conditioning you know because he's done a few combines in the past for like XT that sort of thing and uh, he was trying to get back in shape and you know he was able to bring me into it while he was doing that. Awesome. Um, what are your memories of training you know you've had such an athletic background you've, you've played football um, amateur wrestling, all sorts of different, different, very physically demanding sports. Um, what was the training like? Did that, I mean, you said that it helped prepare you, but you also hear so many stories of wrestlers saying they didn't know it was going to be that tough. Did you have a difficult transition? Uh, was there anything uh, shocking about it or was it just honestly, easy? no, no, I, uh, I always pride myself on being a quick learner, and this was definitely one of those cases where I was just able to, to make a few things click, you know, from the jump. Like I said, I, I give a lot of credit to, to my background, to being able to, to move into it uh, with some things being a little more seamless than the others. And um, I don't want to say it was hard. Once I got used to, to being back in somewhat ring shape, um, it was really easy to kind of pick up and learn from there. 
So how long that did was you really that was really the biggest the biggest obstacle initially was just you know getting used to to running the ropes taking the bumps to to try and how to learn how to slow things down to work the crowd that sort of thing I mean that was really the only hump at the beginning trying to pace. Gotcha. Uh, how long did you train for before they you got had your first match? Do you remember? I want to say I probably trained on and off through different people. Um, for about a year, maybe a little over a year, and then you know, obviously, uh, starting off with some some minute things, working in a bigger tag match, battle royals, that sort of thing, just to get the feel for ring positioning, awareness, that whole thing. And uh, I think I don't know, two or three matches in, was working singles matches from then on. Okay, awesome. Uh, memories of your first ever wrestling match. Do you remember how it came to be? Do you remember, you know, what, how they came about telling you, "Hey, you're 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 ready to roll, man. Let's let's, let's get you in the ring." You know, take me through your first match and how it came to be, if you remember. So with the uh, the training that I had um, up to that point at the promotion that gave me that first match. Um, by that time, you know, they had already seen me train for a little bit with them. And since I had a little bit going into training with them, I was uh, much more ready than, than some of the people I was with. And uh, so they, they said, hey, man, you know, you have some gear or anything? Do you want to uh, participate in this battle royal that we're going to have to try to get out there? And, uh, you know, I had a few things at home, so I just kind of, this is across town, didn't have much of a leg, went and got some stuff. And... Uh, was able to put together a whole, you know, real cheesy gimmick and that sort of thing. And uh, within like five minutes, just came up with some some little idea, whatever, and that ended up being something I rolled with for a little bit. And uh, that's, I was able to get to uh, a, a battle royal to start. And from then on, like I said, it just kind of picked up uh, relatively quickly. Awesome. Um. So you have your first match, you know, you mentioned wasn't very long till you were doing singles matches. Do you remember your first singles match? And what promotion was this? This was in Owensboro, this promotion, correct? Yeah, by the time I had the first singles match, singles it match? was uh, actually here in Evansville. Okay, okay. Um, what was the name of the promotion and, in Evansville? Uh, New Focus. New and Fo I think they go by Refocus now. Okay. Um, I've been to Evansville a couple times, and I, I know there's a there is a wrestling scene in the area, but I'm not too, unfortunately, not too terribly familiar with the the, the indie scene in Evansville. But uh, that's New Focus Pro Wrestling. Okay, awesome. Uh, memories of your first singles match? Um, I'm trying to if I remember right the first singles match. Want to say it was um, a title shot for their at the time with their champion. And uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember exactly if that was it or not. I mean, it was, uh, it was, you know, something I would ultimately work with. I was working face for all of five minutes, you know, <laughs> and uh, I kind of just, you know, obviously with the inexperience was looking. Josh Lewis um, called a match. Sorry, man. Someone keeps trying. It, it's gotta, all. It's all good. Gotta figure it out. I thought I'd put do not disturb on, and I'm still getting called by <laughs> left and right. It's all um, good. Josh Lewis, the guy okay. I was working uh, for the first singles match. He was their champion at the time, so I let him, you know, make dictate the flow of everything as I should have, and. Uh, it was nice and slow paced. It was still um, still got some action in there, and uh, ultimately, it was a really good learning experience for me. Awesome. And um, the way it ended up working out was uh, it led to another match down the line between the two of us, and so he was uh, really the first person I got used to to being in the ring with one on one. It was it was interesting. Um. So you go from there, and you know you. You know, you have him mentor you throughout 
uh, the course of these matches and these singles matches. Um, is this promotion in Evansville, is this kind of your home, or are you are you starting to travel out and get your name out there? Because, I mean, that's Evansville, Indiana. I first saw you in, in Carterville, Illinois. Um, were you making, you know, were you really traveling, or were you kind of, at least at that point in time, more so just focused on Evansville? Yeah, yeah, more so at the time, just kind of, you know, fit right in there and uh, worked for them for uh, a couple months or so, and then uh, they weren't doing anything for a few months beyond that. So I was just kind of just started going, and I was all of a sudden looking for a new home. So I was trying to think to myself, you know, uh, it's not like I want to stop already. It's not, you know, this train just started getting off the tracks and and trying to find a, a place to base up from there. So initially, no, not a lot of traveling was looking for more so just to, to kind of build experience and get as much spring time as possible. And that is where it led me back to Owensboro, um, trying out for the World Wrestling Alliance and been mainly there since. Okay. Um, tell us about the World Wrestling Alliance in Owensboro for those of us that may not be uh, in that area. Um, so one thing that stood out to me when I very – very first started getting training um you know this was for a different promotion there in owensboro um that's no longer running and then there was um you know the world wrestling alliance that was running in owensboro and the surrounding areas and uh, of course i always saw you know ads of theirs i would see their content being published on youtube facebook and they had a really really good looking production you know just from face value and then some of the guys that I was training with began to, you know, go and work for them. And um, like I said, a lot of it had a lot to do with me just not having a permanent home as far as training goes. So it just led to me being there. And that became my, my home base for, you know, going on a few years now. Okay. Awesome. Um, so how did you make your way to stride pro wrestling when I got to see you for the first time in Carterville? Um, I'm trying to think of just exactly how I got in touch with Heath Hatton. Um, I'm not sure if it was through a couple of people in the business. I'm trying to recall that exactly, but it led to me, you know, discussing things with him. He had me come down to a stride show back around May of last year or this year, I'm sorry. And um, wrestled there. And then he ended up inviting me back a couple other times, one of them to rent one park. And then um, another time I wasn't able to, to follow through and, and may attend that day. So um, like I said, trying to remember exactly how I got to talking with him, but early on I got to, uh, to kind of get in cohorts with him. And that ultimately led to where I met you. And uh, right. I had a lot of fun to stride. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to another visit. What are your, you know, we're, we're starting to crawl out of the pandemic and independent wrestling and independent wrestlers are starting to be able to get their feet wet again. What are your, your goals for pro wrestling as we leave, knock on wood, leave COVID behind and start traveling again? What are your, what are your goals for right now? Um, one thing I will say is, you know, if I get too far to, to goals, I've been, you know, for people that have asked me about it in the past, for people that have asked me how, how it works, you know, exactly what I intend to do with it, kind of like uh, what you're asking me here. And I, I've told them, you know, the, as far as I can see, independent professional wrestling, professional wrestling as a whole has really never been hotter in today's day and age, you know, with internet and things like that i mean it's all over the place um, you've got your your bigger promotions you know going back and forth and i mean i i can't think of a time in my memory that i've seen it thrive as much as it has so that that always leads to more avenues here there and everywhere and that's looking at goals i mean I definitely have some lofty ones. You know, I, I want to be able to make my mark. I'd love to to be able to travel, to be able to do, uh, to work. You know, if I can truly get to myself uh, having more than enough living wage just off of wrestling alone, I'll be satisfied, you know. I mean, uh, right. 
there's plenty of people that have so many different avenues through social media, through merchandise, um, through being able to connect with people through all sorts of facets. And to me, that's incredible. To me, that's awesome. To me, I'd really love to, to be able to get to that point. Um, you know, it, it's just so much fun. This is a business that is combining so many different elements and ultimately, uh, I just had a reminder that this past Friday, you know, they had a SmackDown live show here in Evansville, and I was able to sit almost front and center um, watching that and everything about that, you know, the energy in the building, the the showmanship, the you could see how much fun they have doing that. You can tell they love it. And uh, that's that's something I want to be able to attain something I want to be able to say that I, I can do, you know, to go out there and, you know, whether it be signing with a bigger promotion or uh, just working independently and making a career out of that, I would love to be able to do that. So I think as far as goals go, that's that definitely where I want to be, um, you know, looking at more minor things. There's some bigger promotions. There's some names, you know, there's some def- definitely some stuff that I have. I want to put on a list and uh and make my way around doing that you know the the idea of traveling and being able to you know i've seen so many pictures of guys being able to go to japan being able to go to different countries around the world um due to their success and 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 being professional wrestling that's awesome growing up i always wanted to have some sort of athletic career whether it's involved in the business of sports or whether it's as you know a performer uh, an athlete, that's always been my my want. I've always wanted to have that sort of career path. And for me, I see this as an opportunity to do exactly that. Awesome. Um, if no one has seen Jake Bravado wrestle before, do you have any matches or know where anybody could find any matches where if one of my subscribers – who would like to check you out, could check out this match, which one would you direct them towards? Which one would I direct them towards is, uh, it's a pretty good question because I, I, I feel like there can be more than one. There can be more than one. Sure. Sure. I mean, I feel like you haven't seen the best yet. <laughs> so for me to recommend some of the stuff that I feel like is good point A to point B, um, there's some older stuff that I felt like was good. Then you can kind of see the evolution. I mean, if you go back and look at some of the older WWE stuff from, uh, you know, even a couple of years ago up to now, there's some good stuff in there. Some guys that I've been able to work a few times that I really enjoy working guys like uh, Ray Waddell or Jordan Whitaker that I've had some of my best matches with. That's what I would definitely go and check out. I mean, I've got uh, links to stuff like that all over the social media avenues that I have. And um, that'd be a good place to start. And one thing I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about this, and just because I remember it really, uh, uh, it popped me when I saw it on the Facebook timeline. So this Zangif match that apparently happened, you got to tell me about that because we talk video games on this channel too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've always been a big gamer as well. And, uh, you know, never really was a big street fighter guy and always kind of stood back. I mean, uh, I feel like it was always in the shadow. I I much preferred Tekken or combat even. Um, So it's not like I was a (laughs) street fighter fan that's been wanting to do this for a long time. I just felt like it'd be a natural look that I'd be able to pull off. You know, we were trying to come up with a, uh, a theme, me and my attack partner, Tyler Hawkins, we were trying to come up with something to do, you know, and, especially with it being Halloween. And like I said, that that was just something I felt like would be something I could fit the bill for. And uh, that was a lot of fun. It was a new look. And I've done a few other things in the past. You know, I've done Bane. I've done, uh, I've done some other things. And being able to go out and put that look on, that was a lot of fun. Uh, use tried attack. to incorporate some of his moveset, tried to, try to do, you know, some things in the spirit that he would do. Um, just mentioning a tag team partner right now. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you guys started teaming. 
Um, you know, so the promoter of the World Wrestling Alliance came to me at the time, you know, just trying to spin some ideas off me. He said, how do you feel about me putting you with this guy? And, uh, you know, initially, initially, I will, I will be the first to admit I was kind of gun shy about it. Not to sound selfish, but I was thinking, you know, if I'm in a tag team, that means I'm going to be doing a little bit less work <laughs> and I want to, I want to do more of the match, you know, I mean, not to make it all about myself, but initially I was, I kind of didn't want to go with that idea. You know, I was thinking, well, that means matches are going to be worked a little bit differently. Um, and I'm going to have to adjust to that. And at the time, you know, that's not something I'd ever really done in great detail. Right. But um, I, uh, I ended up, you know, kind of sweetening up to the idea. And uh, we, we've had a good run of tag team since. And I've, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed, you know, working a little bit differently. Do you have a favorite... Uh... This is basically what I was asked, like, do you have any good uh, stories from the road or do you have a favorite road trip that you'd like to, you know, just talk about one more time here on the, here on the podcast? Um, nothing in particular. <laughs> you know, I actually went to, uh, now that I think about it, went all the way out to uh, Ricky Morton's school. It's like basically the border of Tennessee and North Carolina. And that was a couple of weeks ago. And, um, uh, uh, you know, of course, I had just left a, uh, a wedding for my old roommate and had a long drive ahead of me and ended up driving through the night just to to go to Ricky's school. And, you know, of course, I had been in prior contact with some of the guys who said that they would have, you know, some people there at the school with the door unlocked so I could <laughs> sleep there. I wrestled Ricky two weeks before I went down there. And I really? uh, was telling him about my plans. I wrestled the Rock and Roll Express with my tag partner, and that was that was a lot of fun. And I mentioned, you know, that I had already signed up to go to a seminar that they were hosting a couple weeks from that day. And he said, man, come on down. You can sleep in the ring if you want to. And I was like, you know, in all honesty, if I'm going to be driving the six-hour drive that it's going to take to get there, I'm going to take you up on that because I'm not going to want to wake up 5 o'clock in the morning and then go and, and be ready to, you know, wrestle and so i ended up driving all the way out to chucky tennessee to to go and, and sleep in the ring and it was miserable i didn't sleep worth a damn uh <laughs> the drive sucked but at the same time it was it was really cool because you know first thing in the morning i'm stirring up waking up and here's ricky morton coming in to wake me up what was your match with the rock and roll express like and what's uh T tell, us, tell us a little bit about, more about just being able to train with Ricky Morton and what Ricky Morton's like. Oh, he's, he's a funny man. Um, <laughs> him, and, uh, him and Robert Gibson, they, uh, they're so much of a pleasure to be around, you know, because, I mean, obviously we knew that we weren't going to go in and tell these guys how, how to work a match. You know, we were going to kind of, <laughs> let them uh, lead us and you know i mean they had the whole thing laid out by the time they got there but did their meet and greet with everybody and whatnot came back started getting dressed they already had the whole thing and so i mean we were just kind of listening and, and learning and i don't know if i've had more fun in a match outside of that match i mean they they had everybody in the palm of their hand we had a good crowd that night i mean you know, it was nice and simple, and it was a blast, quite frankly. You didn't go the way I wanted it to, but, you know, can't win them all. You mentioned that you learned a lot from the Rock and Roll Express in that match. What What do you think, what is the, the piece of advice that Ricky or Robert gave you that you you know you're taking that with you going forward? That's a tough one, because... Uh, there was a few things that really stuck to me. I mean, you know, not to sound cliche, but when, when people tell you to go out there and have fun, I mean, the, the moment that you let the tension leave is when it changes, you know? And as far as a one, one defined takeaway, 
I don't know if I have a good enough answer for that. That's fair. That's very because fair. that was uh, that was you know I, I've been to a few seminars where even like even if there's a few small things that you take away from it, they stick, and that, that's kind of how it was with them. You know, it's not like we we went to go attend a, a bigger learning session with other you know performers, and uh, it was it was so one on one just because we had that opportunity to work with them, and it just a wealth of information. And I was able to, to sit there and absorb it and, you know, just just go out there and, and feed off of the energy of being in the ring with one of the greatest tag teams ever, you know? Right. Um, have you done, is that the, the first seminar you ever did with, a, a, you know, a talent like the Rock and Roll Express or have you done others? Um, let's say, you know, I, I got to learn from, from Tracy Smothers quite a bit before he ended up passing away before he ended up got any good stories about him because i i i I got to i was fortunate enough uh, as a fan just to get to meet tracy once and he's just was just a wonderful human being um got any got any stories about tracy he did such a good job i mean he if, if you ask anybody he was he was the nicest guy you know he was uh he was so pleasant he um he was funny as hell, man. Right. And to to see, you know, like, especially if you go back and look at the order of Tracy Smothers and the way he carried himself and the way he was able to interact with the fans, you would think he's rotten. You would think he's an asshole. And, and it was everything but that, you know, he was oh, yeah, he, such he, a reverse polarity. I mean, when, when you say and you go think that curtain is basically uh, a transition between realms almost you're just stepping out and it's it's all of a sudden completely different and and that's how he was you know he'd go out there and and run his mouth and and like i said just be so nasty to people and then he'd come back through the curtain and be completely different he he was can't the stories about him you know going and sitting and watching matches in the back he was so into it and he would I was fortunate enough to have him watch some of my first matches and, you know, coach me up on it. I mean, he would sit just outside of, you know, whatever merchandise table. And I was able to, it didn't really occur to me at the time, you know, because I was just getting into it, but I was able to have coaching when I first got into professional wrestling by Tracy Smothers. And, you know, as time goes on, that, that just means that much more and more. Right. Um, yeah, Tr- Tracy was at his, at his merch table making everybody laugh. And then he comes out for that main event match and he's got people yelling every obscenity in the world at him. Oh, yeah. Throwing yeah. toilet paper at him and, 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 and like, and he's not even, you know, he's just doing the simplest things. And, and, and me who just, you know, listen to him tell a story about Mick Foley and, Listen to him tell a story about, uh, you know, the FBI and, 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 you know, he's got all just telling stories and being a, you know, be, being like your fun uncle one minute. And then the next minute you're like, fuck that guy. Fuck yeah. Him. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and really like, it was amazing. It was amazing to oh, yeah. me because like I said, as I was still putting everything together, um, I didn't really understand or appreciate how, good he was until you know later on down the line i mean and i feel i could say that for a lot of guys you know as a kid i didn't understand and and going back and and watching and learning as a student um it it changes my perception and i'm like holy shit you know these guys are so good like as a kid i i couldn't tell you whenever i cared about chris jericho because it didn't happen i got older and i'm like damn you know there's so many guys that i feel like I, i can watch and i'm like you know they're great. They're great. I have a whole different outlook on a lot of people's work. And, and Tracy, you know, I mean, when you see stuff and when you learn off of him, he it's it's amazing. Tracy was amazing. And it's a shame. It's just a shame, you know, it just, yeah. It, it sucks that there's a lot of wrestlers now that are not going to get to, to learn from Tracy's mothers. Yeah, and and like I said, it it didn't 
it really registered to me at the time, but being around him as often as, as he was around New Focus a pretty good amount whenever I was first getting into it. And, you know, looking back on it, it's like, damn. You know, another conversation would be awesome. Even if it's just a five minute, you know, him giving out pointers. Right. So, I I appreciate you taking the time to do this. I know we're you know, we're all on a tight schedule today, but uh, oh I'm, no, yeah, you're all good. Thank you so much. Um, if 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 you know, there's a you know, I mentioned earlier to get a a new fan towards a match of yours. You know where to, you know which one to check out. But uh, where can they check you out? Where can some of your stuff be if if they want to learn uh learn even more about Jake Bravado? Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, all at Jake Bravado. Um, I've got a little bit of information up there. You know, I'm, I'm looking to to really kind of set out and make this next year to to, to make a mark. You know, I'm looking to, to expand my reach, to expand my influence, to make sure everybody gets a chance to experience the essence of excellence. And that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do over this next year. really want to see what I can do as far as making my name heard and, and really break into the industry and show everybody what I'm all about. Because at one thing that I will be able to say is given the right amount of, you know, resource, I will outwork anybody. I will do whatever I need to do to, to make that impact that I want to have. And I'm ready to do it. Awesome. Well, I definitely wish you the best of luck. I, I hope you can come back to my area again sometime soon where I can see you, but uh, definitely uh, if you're in Evansville, that's only about a two, two and a half hour drive for me. Maybe maybe one of these days I'll be able to go back to Evansville and check you out. So thanks again, man. Uh, appreciate talking to you. I, I appreciate Duke Randall for uh, introducing us, and uh, thanks again for, for doing the podcast. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, it was a blast. I appreciate you having me. Um, be on the lookout for Jake Bravado. Definitely be on the lookout for Jake Bravado. And if you enjoyed, please give this a like, share, subscribe for more content, not just from the world of pro wrestling, but from the world of comic books, gaming, anime, and all things geek culture. Follow me on social media, facebook.com slash athleticgeek89, twitter at athletic underscore geek89, instagram athleticgeek89. And if you'd like to help improve this channel financially, I am on Patreon. Check out Jake Bravado, and we'll see you next time.